Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MitoAction's monthly expert series. Today, Dr. Rebecca Ganetsky is joining us to discuss lactic acidosis, pyruvate dehydrogenase, investigational new drugs, and you. My name is Stephanie Harry. I'm one of the patient support coordinators at MitoAction and will be your host for today. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on MitoAction's website in the coming days, as well as on our podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar of your screen. If you're calling in via phone, please feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. In today's presentation, Dr. Ganetsky will discuss lactic acidosis and focus on pyruvate dehydrogenase as a case study to explore how compassionate use and clinical trials can be used in patients with mitochondrial disease. We will discuss the importance of family engagement for understanding natural history and disease prevalence in order to ultimately result in successful therapy development. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Ganetsky. Dr. Ganetsky is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and an attending physician in the Division of Human Genetics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, working in the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program and the section of biochemical genetics. genetics. Her research focuses on mitochondrial complex uh, five deficiency and or for deficiency and the development of clinical biochemical assays to improve the diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. Dr. Ganetsky received her undergraduate degree in biology and computer science from Oberlin College and her medical degree from the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. She completed a combined residency in pediatrics and clinical genetics and a subsequent fellowship in clinical biochemical genetics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We're absolutely ecstatic to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for discussing this very, very important topic. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a mouthful of a presentation, um, but what I was asked to share really is to talk about different ways that patients can access investigational new drugs. And I was like, well, um, I actually am not a clinical trialist. I don't have a lot of clinical trial experience, but I've been very involved in using investigational new drugs to treat lactic acidosis and pyruvate dehydrogenase. And I feel really strongly that Part of how adults learn is by sharing stories and by talking about individual cases. So what better way to share with you what I know about investigational new drugs than to do it through some stories that I've been involved with. And maybe my size opens. fantastic. So we're going to talk about lactic acidosis and its relationship to mitochondrial diseases. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. So we're going to start by doing that. Then we'll talk about emergency investigational new drugs, how they work, how they can help you or your child, when you can use them and what the drawbacks to using them might be. We'll talk about how do EINDs work with clinical trials, the phases of clinical trials, the different types of clinical trials and how those relate to investigational new drugs. And then I should have taken the bullet point out a level, but we'll talk about how do we find endpoints for clinical trials? How can families be involved with helping in that process? And the importance of understanding natural history. And we'll do that um, through the case study lens of pyruvate dehydrogenase. And then my hope is that if I've timed my slides correctly, we'll have time for about 10 or 15 minutes of questions at the end. Okay, so I, um, I, first got involved, my very first experience with investigational new drug was related to this case. And this case was a little baby that I took care of who had a pH of 7.11. That's very low. Your normal pH is about 7.35 to 7.45. And why was his pH so low? His pH was so low. Oh, perfect. Um, because his lactate was 17.9. And after I just told one of my students how important units are, I didn't put units on the slide. I'm sorry. Um, that's 17.9 milli equivalents per liter. If you are used to milligrams per deciliter of lactate, that's normal. Um, 
but then you should just convert this in your head to about 170 milligrams per deciliter. And then you'll know that's really, really high. It's about uh, somewhere around 10 times the upper limit of normal. So we were really worried. We had to manage his severe acidosis. And we had to say, is this a lactic acidosis? How do we know? And how do we take care of someone who's this acidotic? So what is metabolic acidosis? Metabolic acidosis is defined by low pH, so a pH that's less than 7.35 from the venous draw, in the presence of low bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is the main base in our blood. Um, and so bicarbonate in this situation is less than 22 milliequivalents. <laughs> and you may or may not, as a result of your low bicarbonate, have low CO2. CO2 is the acid that we breathe out so when we breathe in, we breathe in oxygen. When we breathe out, we breathe out CO2. And when you're bicarbonate, your base becomes low. You may lower your CO2 to compensate for that. And that's called small respiration. It's a very fast way of breathing that really focuses on breathing out. So why do we even talk about acidosis? It's nice that we know what it is, but why do we care? Acidosis is bad for you. It's bad for you in the short term because that respiration when you're breathing out to compensate for your low bicarb, it's fatiguing. It's not sustainable. People can't do that forever. Um, it's bad because if you leave acidosis untreated or you stop compensating, it can make your heart slow down. That's called bradyarrhythmia. It can cause your blood pressure to become low. That's called hypotension. And it can cause the blood pressure in your lungs to become high as you try to compensate. Um, and that's called pulmonary hypertension. And in babies, which this patient is, it can, it can kill babies with mitochondrial disease because of the metabolic acidosis. If people survive, in the long term, having acidosis is bad because it means less carbon in your body, right? CO2 and bicarb are both things that contain carbon. That's why they're called carbon dioxide and bicarbonate. And we're made of carbon. We're carbon-based life forms. And so if we get rid of our carbon, we may not grow well. We might not grow tall. We might not gain weight well. Our brains may not develop. Our brains are, have a lot of myelin, which sheaths our neurons to help them function. And that myelin is made out of carbon. So if you waste that carbon, you might have developmental delay or delayed myelination. And some people are very sensitive to low pH in the central emesis center. And that can cause low appetite or vomiting as a response to having acidosis. Why might people have acidosis? Um, so in mitochondrial disease, there's three major types of metabolic acidosis. You can have ketoacidosis where the acidosis is made of ketones um, because mitochondrial patients are not typical at their ability to use any sort of nutrient for energy. And ketones like beta-hydroxybutyrate are nutrients. And so if you can't use them for energy, they just kind of stick around in your body. And ketones are acids. And so that can cause an acidosis. You can check by checking a urinalysis for ketones, but those actually check for a specific ketone called acetone, which require our bodies to use the ketones first to pee them out. So sometimes people with mitochondrial disease may need to have beta-hydroxybutyrate checked to find out if they're ketotic. Um, lactate. So lactate is a relatively strong acid. And for every one that your lactate goes up, your bicarbonate goes down. The it's, it's about equal. And so lactate is, people tend to get really stressed when the lactate is high. And I always say, people, it's not that strong of an acid. But as it starts to get that you know, most people with mitochondrial disease live with a lactate level that's you know, one and a half to two and a half times the upper limit of normal, which is a lactate of like three, four, five milliequivalents. But as you start to get into the double digits of lactate, you get to 10, 12, 14 milliequivalents, you end up with profound acidosis, like this patient that we're talking about. And finally, patients with mitochondrial disease can have what's called renal tubular acidosis. Renal tubular acidosis means our kidneys are designed to put out in our pee things that we don't need, waste products, urea, and they're designed to pull back from our kidneys things that we do need, like amino acids that we use to grow and bicarbonate. But that takes energy, right, to 
to reclaim all those good nutrients from our urine and not pee them out, that requires energy that our people with mitochondrial disease may not have. And so kidneys from people with mitochondrial disease may waste some of those nutrients. And one of the things that may be wasted is bicarbonate. And so there may not be an acid. It just may be that there's not enough base. And the acid and base have to be balanced. Um, this is important when I think about why people have acidosis. But it's also important because as I think about how to treat acidosis, which I do a lot, I treat it with bicarbonate, um, I realize that people with mitochondrial disease may need more supplemental bicarbonate because they may pee out some of what I give them. So when I do the math to think about how much bicarbonate to give someone, that's something I consider. So in our patient, bicarbonate, I said, is one of the big treatments, but he's very acidotic. So this is an infant who had persistent lactic acidosis. This is now, now the units. Good job, Rebecca. This is our lactate in milliequivalents per liter. And I told you normal is actually very nicely highlighted for you by our electronic medical record in this blue range. And we're way past the blue range, right? Way past the blue range. So we sent a rapid exome and mitochondrial DNA sequencing. And we diagnosed that he had Pearson syndrome. This case is actually published. Um, and his lactate's creeping up into the 20s. That's too high. You cannot give enough bicarbonate to get that down. So we gave him a medication. We asked for an emergency investigational new drug application. It's my very, again, this is my very first time ever using an investigational drug in a patient. And what we asked to use was a medication called dichloroacetate. And so we initiated it here at the blue arrow. What you can see is, we're in this range, we're in the high 20s, we add dichloroacetate and it drops and it drops and it drops and it doesn't ever normalize, but it stabilizes out in a much lower place, which I'll just tell you was low enough that I could give bicarbonate and we were able to have that patient survive to NICU discharge. So, so what is an emergency IND? Why was it a good idea in this case? And what does it do more broadly? So an emergency, Investigational and drug application is one of a number of ways to get an experimental medication. Um, there's kind of, in my head, two big buckets of how we get experimental medications. One big bucket is clinical trials. Um, and we're going to talk about that first because I think it's the most common way. Um, the FDA would certainly like it to be the way that most people who are on an investigational new drug get on an investigational new drug. And the other way is an expanded access. And an emergency investigational new drug, which I will start probably calling an EIND, but it's also called a single IND application, is a one way to get expanded access. There's also open label extensions of clinical trials. That's another type of expanded access. And then there's also group expanded access. Everything that's part of expanded access is also sometimes called compassionate use or compassionate access. It's very confusing. Um, and technically, all of this is under the umbrella or the header IND for investigational new drug. Um, and that is the term, the people who approve this and who give the terms for this are is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which decides who can get experimental medications and how. So we'll talk about clinical trials first. So there's multiple types of clinical trials. The first is preclinical. Preclinical is not involving people. It's stuff that you do in animals or in cells to identify potential drugs that might be beneficial. You have phase one clinical trials. Those are trying to find out what dose of the medication is safe. How much is toxic? How much you need to get to get a nice steady state? They're not designed to ask the question, does this drug work? Sometimes people with disease are used in phase one clinical trials. Other times they use healthy controls just to simply see what dose is correct. Phase two trials are designed to study efficacy. Does the drug work? And the other thing that they're saying to ask is, does the drug work? And what side effects happen when the drug works? And then finally, phase three is a larger scale study. And in mitochondrial and rare diseases, often phase two and phase three come together because we don't really have the patients for a 500 patient study. That'd be ridiculous. Um, and so phase two, three studies might be 20 
50, 100, depending on how broad the umbrella for the indication of the disease is, to see does it work and what the side effects are. And then finally, those lead into open label or post-market studies, which are continuation of a drug for patients who are enrolled in a phase one, phase two, or phase three study, who may continue to get it, may continue to get some evaluations from the study, but are not technically part of an official study anymore. And the drug company or the sponsor of the trial may continue to collect safety data and efficacy data in that open label extension phase. Clinical trials have inclusion criteria. That means who's in the study. And those might be things like you have to have a molecular diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. Some studies, uh, I made this slide now a couple of years ago, and it was very common when I made this slide that not everyone with mitochondrial disease had even had molecular testing yet. So, so it was like, oh, okay, if you think you have mitochondrial disease and you haven't had molecular testing, we really want people to be included in the study. So we might pay for that testing. It's less common now as more and more people have molecular testing already performed. It might be specific. So this is, um, I'm talking about my experience with pyruvate dehydrogenase. So it might be, you have to know that you have pyruvate dehydrogenase to be in the study. It can't be that you have complex one disease or a fatty acid oxidation defect. And they may even be more specific than that. So for instance, um, the phase three clinical trial for pyruvate dehydrogenase that is going on currently that I'm the site investigator for here at CHOP, you have to have pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency due to a mutation in the alpha or beta or X subunit. Um, and you can't have a mutation in the E3 subunit of pyruvate dehydrogenase. So in the reason for the specificity, we'll talk about a lot, but it's to try to make the group as homogenous as possible while keeping the numbers high so that you can really understand what does it mean for the disease to get better. And there may be specific symptoms. For instance, you might have to have myopathy in order to qualify, and you might have to have seizures in order to qualify. And again, that's for the purpose so that it's an easier question to ask. Did seizures get better? Did vision get better? Did muscle strength get better, right? So that the group can measure what got better. It might be a specific age category. It might be, we're only using adults. The FDA prefers that studies start in the adult population. It turns out that the um, pyruvate dehydrogenase study that I'm involved with actually only uses kids because they were concerned about a side effect that had been seen in kids, in adults, but not kids. And it may be that you have to be able to participate in some sort of testing. So for instance, a lot of drug trials use the six minute walk test, six minute walk test as their primary endpoint. And so in order to be included, you have to be able to do a six minute walk test. So you have to be able to walk for six minutes. Exclusion criteria are the reverse. There are people who can't be in the study. So it might be you don't have a specific finding or you don't have a specific symptom. On the flip side, it could be things are too severe. You know, and so, you know, you getting better may not look the same as other people in the study getting better. And we don't know how to account for that statistically. So for instance, people have a tracheostomy or our ventilator dependent might not be able to participate in the study. Being allergic to something is often an exclusion factor. Most commonly and most importantly for the mitochondrial disease community, it may be an exclusion criteria if you're doing other trials at the same time, right? Um, in, uh, I have a kid in elementary school science right now, and we're just like really trying to drill in. You can only test one hypothesis at a time. You can't have two related or like kind of associated hypotheses and test both. And that's the same here, right? You can't be on investigational drug A and investigational drug B at the same time. Because if you get better, we don't know if A or B caused it. And similarly, they may require that you've been stable on whatever mitochondrial medicines you've been taking for six months, a year, um, or some amount of time like that. Trials have designs. They can be placebo controlled. Placebos are a non-active compound that kind of 
feels like, smells like, tastes like, looks like the drug. Um, you can have open label, just you are a patient and you get the drug. You can have controlled. So some patients get drug and some patients get placebo. You can get crossover where people who got drug after a period of time where the drug leaves their system, which is called the washout, get placebo. And people who first got placebo got drug. Crossover studies are very common in small disease populations. So we see them a lot in the mitochondrial disease population. Um, Sites so can be randomized. So you might be in either group. It might be 50-50. It might be different than 50-50. It might be more people are getting drugs than placebo. It can be blind, where you don't know which of the two you're getting. And it can be double blind, where neither you nor the physician or the researcher know what you're getting. Um, so right now I'm involved in a double blind um, crossover trial. And this drives my patients nuts. They're like, I think time period one was much better than time period two. Is that right? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what you got in time period one and time period two. They're like, okay. When the study ends, you're going to know, right? And I'm like, I mean, the statisticians will know, but I personally know, like, I'm never going to be unblinded. I don't know. I'm like, but I want to know. And I'm like, I do too, but that's not what we get to find out. That's just not how it works. Other factors in trial design. So to, for most of my patients, the biggest consideration in choosing a clinical trial is site. Is it a single site study where you have to go to a center, to England, to Philadelphia, to California? Does, you know, And that's a big deal for families, especially if you have to go multiple times. Um, Multi-site. So um, the dichloroacetate phase three study that I alluded to before is a multi-site center, right? I'm the Philadelphia PI. I spy that Jerry Bedoyan is here on the participants list. He's the Pittsburgh PI. We're all working together. We're doing the same study under the oversight of Peter Stackpole, who's the overall PI, which means principal investigator, person in charge. Multi-site centers studies are kind of nice because you can go to the one that's closest to you and often we get bigger numbers that way. Um, but some studies may not have, you know, if it's very sophisticated or very involved, it may be hard to get the exact same protocol up and running at multiple centers. Um, there might be additional studies, either for safety testing or for efficacy testing as part of the trial. You might get labs, you might get images, you might get biopsies, and you may or may not, as a patient, get those results released. And then the other big question is, can you keep doing whatever medications you're currently established on? So those are trials. Now we're going to talk about emergency investigational new drugs. Um, and there are other single-use IND applications that aren't emergencies, but it's almost always used in an emergency situation, like the situation that I that I introduced you to. So we're going to talk about what, what is an EIND, who gets involved, what the process looks like, what does that mean to you? And then we'll summarize that part. So an emergency investigational new drug, it's an emergency. So we're using an investigational drug or device or biological product in a person. So when I get approved to do it, I get to do one patient. That patient is in a life-threatening or severely debilitating situation without a standard acceptable treatment. Life-threatening doesn't mean that they're going to die in an hour, but it means that they are very likely to die over time with if they're not treated. And it, it can be either life-threatening or sever, severely debilitating. And severely debilitating means if I don't treat this, something irreversible is going to happen, like blindness or loss of a limb or loss of hearing or paralysis or stroke. To do an EIND, it involves a doctor and the doctors usually is the one who starts the conversation. They call the manufacturer, they send paperwork to the FDA, they ask for approval of their institution, they get the pharmacy involved and they get consent from the family. So all of those things. But you need all those other people involved too. So you need the drug manufacturer to agree. Yes, this sounds like a good idea. And we are going to provide the drug to you 
and we will give you a letter that is says that we are sponsoring you to do this. They usually give uh, an investigational brochure or some portion thereof that says, you know, this is our history using this drug experimentally. This is what we think some side effects might be. This is our dosing guidelines. These are the inactive ingredients in case any of those, you know, interact with other meds or allergies. And then they usually ship the drug to the hospital pharmacy. Um, in an END process, the manufacturer may choose to ship the drug at no cost. Um, they may also charge. They're allowed to. Um, but it makes it very challenging because I'll tell you that we'll get to institutions and pharmacies. Neither of them are really excited about paying for an investigational drug when they don't know whether it's going to work or not. Um, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, approves the application. So usually when it's an emergency, you send a form in and then the doc calls the FDA. This is actually really fun. Um, hey, you can do it on weekends. Um, and the FDA calls you back and says, okay, what have you tried so far? Have you convinced me that you've tried everything that really exists that's been approved already? Convince me that this is life-threatening. And if they agree, then they ultimately will approve the process and then they will continue to follow up. So the physician will keep telling them, okay, this is how the kid's doing. Okay, here's my labs this week. Um, the family has to agree. This is an experiment. It's not guaranteed to work. And so someone has to sit down with the family and do an informed consent where you talk about risks and benefits and alternatives. Then the pharmacy receives the drug, they review their paperwork, they make sure they understand how to administer and prepare the drug safely, and they give it. And then eventually, um, usually simultaneously to all of this going on, the Institutional Review Board, which oversees the safety of experiments and the eth ethical nature of the experiment, has to be notified that this is happening and issue concurrent approval. Often that happens in parallel to the rest of the process, which is different from non-emergency experiments and non-emergency ex investigational new drug administration, where the IRB has to approve it first before you start any of the rest of this process. So an ideal timeline might look like this. So on day one, the physician calls the FDA and there's like a voicemail. And so you leave a, a message on the voicemail to obtain authorization, um, and then they'll call you back. And while you're waiting for them to call you back, you contact the manufacturer and see if they will agree to provide you drug. And you tell the family, this is what I want to do. And you give them an informed consent. By day two, the FDA has called you back and they've approved it. And the manufacturer arranges for shipping and we get pharmacy involved and ready to receive the, same, the drug. It usually arrives on day three along with the sponsor letter and the pharmacy prepares for and gives the drug. So this takes three or four days. So we said it's an emergency. I've said like the FDA, I seem to only do this on like holidays. So the FDA has called me on the 4th of July. Um, last time I left the voicemail during work hours, but they called me back while I was trick or treating with my kid. You know, it's, it's an emergency. You drop whatever you're doing and you talk to the FDA, but it still takes three or four days to get the drug to the patient. And from day five onward, you notify the IRB that this is happening. Hopefully the IRB approves. And then we you put you send in the actual paperwork to the FDA that has all of the information written, as well as a sponsor letter. And then the FDA sends a summary. You the physician sends to the FDA a summary of what's happened so far. How is drug safety going? So what is the risk and what is the benefit? So the physician who's consenting we should talk to a family about the risks and benefits to decide whether this is right or not. And families get to decide and sign the informed consent form. The advantage is access to an investigational drug that we have reason to believe will benefit you or your child, but hasn't gone through rigorous here as a coder for time consuming FDA approval process. And almost always you get it for free. Um, and it's a team process where everyone on the team really wants the patient to do well. They've invested time, 
and energy and often money to, to get it done. But it doesn't always go perfectly. So I said, you know, ideally it happens on day three or day four, but it might take longer than that. There's a lot of steps. Um, the manufacturer has to agree to provide the investigational drug and not all manufacturers will. Not because they're mean or bad, but because they just may not be set up to ship out a single dose of the drug. All of the drug might be bound up in clinical trials. They may have paused manufacturing the drug, right? It's not a drug that's readily available. Um, they, the, and, you know, the, there may be delays in other steps in the process. Um, the FDA may say, gosh, we don't know enough about this condition or this drug to, to provide approval. We need to read a little bit more. So that might push it from day three or to day four. Um, and this has to be sponsored by someone, usually a drug company. Um, and so if the drug kind of failed clinical trials and is between drug companies, it may be that although the drug exists, no one is making it or willing to sponsor it. There are also expanded access, so non-clinical trial and non-individual use protocols. So there are emergency protocols, which sounds a lot like an emergency IND, and it's similar, but it's set up as a protocol. So you allow several patients to do the exact same protocol, and it's kind of approved by the FDA as, okay, like we haven't approved that you'll put Jane Smith in this protocol, but we've approved the overall idea. And when Jane Smith has an emergency, you'll tell us and we'll approve that particular person. Um, there's open access, which I mentioned before, that's you were in the clinical trial and now the clinical trial is over, but it takes some months to do all the statistics from the clinical trial and present them to the FDA and convince the FDA that the drug works. And while all that's happening, people who are in the trial continue to get study drug. That's called open access. There is intermediate sized expanded access protocols. I, I spent a long time on the FDA website over the last week trying to figure out exactly what counts as intermediate size and I can't. This is non-emergent. So one of the things that's different is you need up to a 30 day waiting period for all the normal paperwork. No one expedites it. So it's not an emergency. Um, it allows for multiple patients to be enrolled. And the idea is that there's some evidence that medication works. So patients get a right to try it, but those meds have not been approved by the FDA. And the most common scenario for an intermediate size expanded access trial is that the drug failed to meet its primary endpoint. When we look at dichloroacetate as like a case study of clinical trials, what I'll show you is that good drugs can still fail to meet their primary endpoint because they only work for a subset of patients in the study or because the primary endpoint wasn't perfectly chosen, but it really helped the kids with seizures, even though the primary endpoint was weakness or because it did help everyone with weakness, but not in the time frame we were expecting in the clinical trial, right? So if there's that level of evidence that the drug works, but the FDA hasn't approved it because what you agreed in advance was the primary endpoint wasn't met, that might be something that there's an intermediate size expanded access drug for. Intermediate size expanded access might be parallel to a clinical trial. You know, you might want to be in the dichloroacetate phase three clinical trial, but you have pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency due to a mutation in the E3 subunit, or you don't meet the inclusion criteria because you're on a trach and a ventilator. So that might be something where an intermediate size expanded access protocol will be approved. There isn't one for dichloroacetate. Those were just examples. Um, widespread expanded access is like intermediate size expanded access. And the most co common indication for a widespread expanded access is that it's used as a clinical trial is ending to bridge from the patients who all got to enroll in the clinical trial to we assume the drug is going to work and then they'll be on the market and lots of people will get it then. But in between is kind of a gray zone where you can't get into the clinical trial because it's closed because it's doing statistical analysis and everything else. And the people who were enrolled are getting this drug through open access. 
you can't get it from the marketplace yet because it's not on the market yet. And so that's often a time when there'd be a widespread expanded access trial to just allow patients who think we think will benefit from the drug to get it in that in-between period. Um, all of these things, all five of them, including an emergency IND, are sometimes referred to as compassionate use or expanded access. Um, and you can see that each of them is a little bit different, both in the timeline that you might expect to get the drug, um, whether or not the drug is at, under analysis versus has previously failed a study, and also things like emergency protocols and intermediate sized expanded access may also require you go, to go to a specific center in order to access them, even though they're not formally part of a clinical trial. Okay, so for Part three, which is the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about dichloroacetate and the dichloroacetate phase three clinical study as kind of an example of how clinical studies are built and how we think about them. So um, I spend a lot of my time, if you've seen other talks by me, you know that I spend almost all of my clinical time thinking about metabolic acidosis caused by mitochondrial diseases. Um, and when I first started doing that, I told families, you know, if your lactate is over 20, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. And I hated that. Um, and as I've gotten to do this job more and more, I've thought about the tools in my toolbox to help kids with profound severe acidosis. Clinically approved, we have very limited tools. We have sodium bicarbonate, which is a direct buffer. It's a base. We have some other buffers that aren't direct buffers that work maybe less well. Some, some people with mitochondrial disease, it works. Some doesn't. Um, we're going to focus on dichloroacetate, which is an emerging therapy. And what dichloroacetate does, here I've abbreviated it DCA. What it does is it activates the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex really acts as a switch between the rest of our cell, which gets energy by making glucose into pyruvate, and it doesn't get a lot of energy. This is a very inefficient way to get energy, but it does it. Into pyruvate making acetyl-CoA. And this, you have to imagine like a wall here. This is entering the mitochondria in the TCA cycle and downstream the electron transport chain, which is how we get most of our cellular energy and is very efficient. If your mitochondria doesn't work as well, it there's a feedback that tells your body, you know, just keep the pyruvate in the cell itself. Don't, don't bother trying to make it into acetyl-CoA and actually just keep it as lactate, which is a really strong acid. It, you know, because the body doesn't know that it has mitochondrial disease. It just thinks, oh gosh, like I ate a really big meal and I have a lot of food and I just need a second to catch up. So just hold it as lactate for a second. That works out fine if you're a marathon runner, right? Right after you run a marathon or a sprint or eat a big sugary meal, your lactate will bump. It'll actually bump up into the range seen in most people with mitochondrial diseases. And then if you don't have mitochondrial disease, as your body catches up, it'll come back down. People with mitochondrial disease, that doesn't happen. And so if you give dichloroacetate, you kind of like force it through, even though the body's trying to keep it as lactate, it forces it through pyruvate to acetylcholate to the TCA cycle, brings that lactate down, treats acidosis. And I, sh I show you it worked in my first case. And then the other idea is to use niacin or niacinamide. And when I said the body knows that the mitochondria aren't caught up, the way the body knows is that NADH, which is the main food for the mitochondria is accumulating. And it's like, oh gosh, I've got a lot of NADH. And so it, it moves that pyruvate over into lactate. Um, and so if you give more niacin and niacinamide, the idea is that it, that will become NAD and you'll have more NAD than you have NADH and your body will realize, oh, like maybe I should move this back towards my mitochondria. So dichloroacetate is widely available right now only for emergency INDs. And um, I have lost count of how many emergency INDs for dichloroacetate I've been involved in. I think the number is seven. Um, there's a phase three clinical trial that's currently closed to enrollment that was focused on pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. And I think that 
we're going to spend a lot of time talking about dichloroacetate in pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. And I think it's an important story for how families and patients can advocate for clinical trials to be designed to be maximally successful and patient focused. So how to make clinical trials work. To make a good clinical trial, we have to understand what the disease is when you don't treat it, because we don't know what better is unless we know what the disease is. We have to know the full range of patients from the mildest patient with the disease to the most severe patient with the disease. And we need to understand how things that we can measure relate to how the disease is doing. Is lowering lactate important or is it just a marker that you you can kind of gloss over the biochemistry of the disease, but it doesn't actually make patients better? Um, you have to know how common the disease is so that they know how to market the drug and price the drug effectively. How many people have that disease? Um, and in general, bigger clinical trials build on what we understand from individual patients who do well. Um, it's important to know that this takes time. So this is the time, this is my timetable for pyruvate dehydrogenase. The biomarker of how to measure lactate and pyruvate was diagnosed, was discovered in the 1960s. Pyruvate dehydrogenase was first named as a syndrome in the 70s. And they thought, gosh, maybe some diet treatment might work. And they tried it in a case. In the 1980s, we realized that there are people with mild and severe disease. We learned that the most common gene cause of pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency is PDHA1. And we tried DCA in a case. In the 90s, we had gene sequencing. In the 2000s, we realized that there's actually multiple different genetic types of pyruvate dehydrogenase. And we started to use animal studies, preclinical models for treatment with DCA. And there was a DCA trial for mitochondrial disease in general that failed to meet its primary endpoint. And now here we are in the 2020s doing the phase three clinical trial. So this is a 60 year process that started with our first patient being treated with this drug 40 years ago and a first phase three clinical trial 20 years ago. Um, I also wanna say it's important to do these small and sometimes even failed clinical trials because otherwise we're building on retrospective natural history. So just to pick on myself, um, in 2010, I thought I knew lots of things about pyruvate dehydrogenase. I thought I knew what this spectrum of disease was. I thought that I could just group them in with my other patients with Lee syndrome. I thought that I knew how to diagnose them biochemically. Um, and so a colleague reached out to me, Saskia Warman, and said, we're putting together a case series of patients with PDCD. Can you contribute some? And I was like, sure, Saskia, I'd be happy to. Um, and so I started putting together my cases and I started looking at them. And once I started looking at them systematically, I realized that I did not know many things about pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, so this was a little boy. He was three. I met him at the Blue Arrow. And his main problem was that he wasn't growing. He had Lee syndrome, and this is his brain MRI, and he wasn't breathing well. So this is his brain MRI. And what is below his brain MRI is a read from our metabolic lab, which says the levels of pyruvate and lactate and the ratio of lactate to pyruvate are essentially normal. And this little orange asterisk on his brain MRI is looking at his lactate in his brain, and that's also normal. And I was like, okay, well, that can't be pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency because they have high lactate and pyruvate. But I double checked, or, you know, I don't know the word for seven times checking, and they were always normal. But he indeed has pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. And I had another case who was a 15 year old man who had a long standing diagnosis of PDH, and he had audio and visual hallucinations. And his parents felt like he'd become disengaged and was having some psychotic symptoms. He was a really mild PDH kid. He was doing well in school. He could do read, he could do math, he could write, which by the way, I did not realize at the time was part of the spectrum of pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so we thought, are his hallucinations related to his meds? Are they seizures? Could this be true to an unrelated? Schizophrenia isn't rare. And this I'm saying 
it's really important for physicians to publish. If a physician asks if they can publish your case, please say yes, um, because we learn from each other. So I searched psychosis and pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, and I got a single case report. And I was like, well, I don't know, two. I, there's a lot of patients with pyruvate dehydrogenase in the world. Schizophrenia isn't rare. So I emailed the Mito listserv and I was like, is this a thing? And they said, hi, Rebecca. Um, we actually had a patient who was an engineer with pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. He reached middle age and he was doing great. He had an advanced degree and then developed schizophrenia. And so I think that's the other thing that is a really valuable lesson. You want doctors who are not afraid to say, I don't know. And then the second part of that sentence always has to be, but I'm willing to phone a friend for you. And so we have to learn from each other. Okay. Things that we have to do before a clinical trial, we have to do a national natural history studies so that we know what does better mean and we can understand the late symptoms of the disease as they approach adulthood and the full spectrum of disease. And the best strategy for that is the longitudinal natural history study, which in private dehydrogenase deficiency is run by Jerry Bedoyan in Pittsburgh. We have to understand quality of life, what matters to parents and to patients. Right? I don't, I'm not in charge of whether a patient is better or not. They are in charge of whether they're better and what better means to them. Different people from different cultural backgrounds, different personalities may have different things that they want to get better. Some patients might say, look, I really want to walk. And if I still have breakthrough seizures, that's fine. And other patients will say, I hate having seizures. I don't care if I'm in a wheelchair. I can do whatever I want from my wheelchair, but I don't want to have a seizure. So we have to look at patient reported outcomes and survey data. And then we have to ask, gosh, getting patient reported outcomes and longitudinal studies are great, but they're not fast. And we want to treat people. We want these studies to happen. We want to know relatively quickly whether or not a drug works so that we can get it to people. So are there biomarkers or imaging studies or other things that we can look at that will help us understand whether a disease is getting better more quickly. So what we need from you, um, physicians need to see a lot of patients with the same rare disease to really understand and appreciate it. I hope that I, by confessing my own humility and my own times that I've been wrong about this disease have, have emphasized that. So it's important for groups of patients to work together as part of advocacy groups. I always tell my patients, I, I'm never embarrassed if a patient wants a second opinion. I'm not offended. I will phone friends and get you in for a second opinion. Um, that's part of my job because the more patients we see, the more we learn. And these are rare diseases. And so people might not have seen the specific things that you want to know about. Um, patients should work together to advocate for what they want and to advocate for trials and for trials that address the outcomes that patients are interested in. Be honest about what, what matters to you and what you want to make better, because we can only make you better if you tell us how to make you better, and understand that these things take time. So that's what I had to say. And before I open for questions, I just want to say thank you to my team here, um, and in particular, Jamie Peterson, who's the genetic counselor who sees all my PDCD patients with me, and Cass Pantano, who's the nurse practitioner who takes care of them when they're admitted so that I can do things like this, um, uh, Laura McMullen, who helps me with my emergency INDs, and Caitlin Stanley, who's my amazing clinical research coordinator on the phase three clinical trial, um, and Sue Clement from Sal Pharmaceuticals, who helped me with slide preparation, and everyone involved in the phase three clinical study for dichloracetate. And now I'm really excited to take questions. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It was it was fabulous and very, very informative. Um, we've had some questions come in and I wanted to start with, if, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the DCA treatment um, that you've given under emergency use and have you used that in both um, adults and pediatric cases? And is there a variance in what you've seen with that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the patients that I've treated with the emergency IND treat protocol with dichloroacetate have largely been kids. And that's in part because of the pathophysiology of the disease. Um, usually people who have very high lactates that are life-threatening, 
um, have such a profound mitochondrial defect that they present in childhood. Um, we have one adult patient that we've talked back and forth about. She's had a couple of life-threatening episodes and, and then stabilized and then had another episode and then stabilized. And so we've kind of, we've debated back and forth and we, we have not done it yet. Um, I anticipate that we may get pushback from the FDA about an emergency IND in adults because the phase three clinical trial does have adults as an exclusion criteria right now. Okay. Um, that's because the original phase three clinical trial for DCA had some adults who developed peripheral neuropathy while on the trial. And um, that side effect has never been seen in kids. So the FDA felt like the drug was safer right now in kids than adults. Um, I, my personal opinion is that peripheral neuropathy is a mild side effect when you're talking about a potentially life-saving drug. So I wouldn't be hesitant to use it in adults, but I, I would imagine I'd have to convince the FDA. Well, thank you for your, for your hard work and, and pushing in that direction, you know, if that, if that's what needs to happen for, for the patients and for them to be, to be safe. I'm curious, like, can you explain a little bit about the difference between maybe, and I know this is a huge topic, it might be another, but maybe briefly like about lactic acidosis in children versus like adults, like when, um, like as an adult, like when should you be concerned in regards to like your lactic acidosis? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a really good question. Um, children have less tolerance for metabolic acidosis. And part of that is like kids breathe faster at baseline. So asking them to breathe even faster, is, it, it becomes mechanically challenging. Um, we also see severe acidosis more commonly in kids than we do in adults, which I think is related to the different types of mitochondrial disease that happen in kids and adults. Um, finally, and I see the some questions about metabolic acidosis in pregnancy. My Concern is that in kids, acidosis also impairs calcification of bones and teeth. And as kids are just growing their bones and teeth, you can see problems from that. And so I, I care a lot more about getting my kids like perfect with their acid base. Um, adults with mitochondrial disease may still have elevated lactate. Usually it's in a range that doesn't cause acidosis. So if your lactate is like twice the upper limit of normal, your body usually can just absorb that. It doesn't even cause acidosis. We just call that lactic acidemia, but not lactic acidosis. But when people are sick or stressed or especially post-exercise, it can go higher. And so it's certainly something I worry about. And I do worry about metabolic acidosis in pregnancy as well, um, which was the question that was asked in the chat. Um, I worry about the safety of the fetus and its bone mineralization and its development. Um, but I also worry a lot about mom safety. You know, moms have less respiratory capacity as the uterus grows and impinges on the lungs. And so respiratory compensation is harder. Um, I actually have not been in a situation where I've had a pregnant mom develop lactic met metabolic acidosis. And surprisingly, moms who don't have mitochondrial disease, who are pregnant with a fetus with mitochondrial disease, don't develop acidosis during pregnancy. Um, the, the mom's metabolism kind of takes over for the babies during pregnancy. Oh, that's interesting. Do you like, you know, now that you've said that you've never run into that, there could be a chance that you do run into that because that's how science works. Like that is how half works. like... <laughs> Like in your mind, like, is there like a way that you think you would approach that differently? Or is that kind of an unfair question to ask? Cause it's not something you've experienced yet. Yeah. I mean, so I think one of the things that's really challenging is that pregnant pregnancy is considered a special population and it is very hard to get approval for investigational drug use in pregnancy. Um, I, bicarbonate is a very safe buffer. Um, the biggest concern about using bicarbonate is that for some patients, it's incredibly nauseating. Um, for others, it's not. It's it's basically Tom's. Um, my my mentor used it. It's literally baking soda. And so my mentor just used to give people baking soda instead of writing a prescription. Um, and so like it's it, right, like it's great, except that it it can create carbon dioxide in your stomach and make you burp. It's the same way that taking a lot of tums can do that. And so 
for people in pregnancy who are already having GI side effects, that can be harder. Um, and so, you know, you, I, I would probably have a lower threshold for thinking about IV medications and inpatient monitoring for a pregnant person who had severe metabolic acidosis. What is your, you mentioned the baking soda and um, I've heard of, I've heard of patients trying to use the baking soda at home. What is your advice in regards to doing that, not being monitored by a doctor or like, are there dangers in that? Yeah. So the thing that's really challenging about acid base is that it has to be in balance with each other. Um, and we've had these challenges, even sometimes in the hospital where we're giving someone bicarbonate but their acid production decreases for whatever reason. I've actually, this happened to me a scary number of times. And you have to be able to rapidly respond to that by giving less base. If you give a lot of base and all of a sudden there's not acid, you get the opposite of acidosis, which is called alkalosis. And alkalosis is really scary because our brain does the opposite. It stops breathing fast. It's like, oh, I guess I don't need to breathe if there's no acid but you do need to breathe because you need oxygen. Um, and the brain doesn't know that. So that's why I am pretty cautious. Um, when I have patients on bicarbonate, I'm very exact about how much they get. And I usually check their levels pretty frequently. And I, I will say the flip side of this is also dichloroacetate can lower someone's lactate pretty quickly. And so if someone's really sick, if they're on you know 100 milligrams per kilo of bicarb, which I do sometimes, um, when I initiate dichloroacetate, I usually do that in the hospital so that I can do that rapidly down titrating of their bicarb. Okay. So we have two more questions. One is if, if a drug is a U.S. drug, do all doctors in foreign countries have equal access to like the EIND? Yeah. So that's a great question. And the answer is no. Um, the FDA is only the U.S. FDA. You have to be in the U.S. to submit an, any type of IND application, whether that's an emergency or single-use or multi-use IND. Um, the FDA has an equivalent organization in Europe, the e, I think it's the EPA, um, and they have their own processes. Sometimes drugs that are approved in other countries might be available for EIND here and vice versa but other times not. And I can tell you lots and lots of stories of drugs that I think are very safe, but I have not been able to get in the U.S. Um, even through an EIND process because there isn't a U.S. manufacturer and the FDA doesn't have U.S. data on the drug. So that's, that's definitely international medicine is really challenging. The, the other question is, and this kind of bounces back to your earlier conversation in regards to lactic acidosis, you mentioned carbon wasting and how it can result in a delayed myelination. And I'm curious if you see that effect of um, the myelination effect on children and adults, like when, when they've had lactic acidosis for an extended period of time. Yeah. So myelin deposition primarily happens in childhood. Okay. Um, it's You're usually maximally myelinated around age six. So in adults, we usually don't see myelin abnormalities from acidosis alone, but we do in children. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ganetsky. I really, really appreciate all of your wisdom and knowledge and your willingness to share all of this information with us. It's been fabulous. I know we've all learned so much and we really, really appreciate you and all the hard work that you're doing for our community. So thank you so much. And um, just to let all the listeners know, if you came in late or if you um, are hoping that somebody else or a loved one can hear this presentation, it is has been recorded and will be posted um, on the coming days on Mito Action and or our um, Google Play, Spotify, and all those great podcast places. So we look forward to seeing you again next month and we um, hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thanks so much for having me.